as absolutely nobody could have possibly predicted, the first ever administration of the remotely proctored LSAT Flex did not go entirely smoothly. I'm shocked, shocked. Today, we're joined by one of our students to discuss her LSAT Flex test, the good, the bad, and the proctor you of it all. Welcome to The Legal Level, a podcast from TestMax. I'm Yelena. And I'm Brandon. We're your companions on the road to the legal field, whether you've just started thinking about law school or you've already passed the bar. What are you, a lawyer? The Legal Level is available from Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and wherever you're listening to it right now. With us today is Zaina Hatem, an LSAT Max student and aspiring healthcare attorney who took the LSAT Flex this week. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So, Zaina, tell us a little bit about kind of the journey to taking the LSAT for you. How did you study? When did you start studying? And especially when did you realize that you were going to have to take it in an at-home format rather than the test that you'd originally scheduled? Of course, I'm happy to. So I always thought about being a lawyer and I really started studying for the LSAT January uh, I know that's pretty short for typical LSAT studiers, but I really wanted to push hard. Um, I left my current position and started really studying hardcore within the last three months. And I was signed up for the April exam. And after everything started happening with the pandemic, pandemic right here. I realized, you know, I might not be able to take my LSAT and my studying kind of was going up and down because you never know what's going to happen. You get stuck to the news. And early on in April, LSAC announced that they'd be making an online exam at home, take home. So what were your thoughts when you found out about the Flex? Did you have any anxieties about taking it? Did you consider taking the option to defer to a later, hopefully in-person LSAT rather than doing the Flex? Or were you eager to do it? So at first, I was a little bit in shock that they actually came up with this scenario for students. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to take it. But then I said, OK, well, I'm going to be at home. I'm going to be comfortable why not take it? And then when I heard it was three sections, I was like, that's great. I don't have to fight against stamina on top of it. So I immediately requested to be signed up for the May Flex and went from there. So did having to take the Flex change how you studied for the exam? To be honest, yes. At first, it didn't. But as I started to learn more, like as I started to learn that the scoring was going to be equal, that really made me rethink how I was studying because I realized everything was going to be graded equally. And while I was much stronger with logic games and logical reasoning, I wasn't very strong in reading comprehension. So I knew I needed to put a lot of attention into it because now it was all equally scored and that changes the game completely. And I know, and we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves talking about the exam itself, but did you feel like, especially a lot of students had issues with the reading comp, I know there were no line numbers, and so did you feel like the studying that you put in prepared you for specifically that section of the LSAT flex, or was it a surprise to you? So if you went and looked at the exams on the Law Hub, they didn't have line numbers, and if there was a specific like minor point question, they highlighted that. And that was exemplified in the law hub. So that was no surprise to me because I, I took the precautions and the, the measures to make sure I was prepared for that. That was a, a wise decision that we hope will have uh, served you well when you get your score back. It sounds like you really did everything you could to prepare. So let's let's jump forward to test day. I mean, first of all, what uh, which date did you take the test? Yeah, of course. I actually took it on May 19th at 11.50. And let's, uh, let's just walk through that. Tell us, you know, kind of beginning to end how that went for you. Of course. So I woke up early in the morning because I wanted to be ready and mentally prepared. Had a little breakfast, started my day and kind of went through and read a couple questions. I put aside some questions that I really thought I did well with and I liked so that I felt prepared. And then I logged onto my computer and I put ProctorU up on my screen. 
and I let the countdown go. I watched that probably for two hours waiting for my time to come. It started about five minutes early. They let you log in about five minutes before your exam. So you actually, you had a proctor available right when you logged in. You didn't experience waiting for a proctor. So right when you log in, you're actually not prompt to go and see a proctor. When you log in, you're going to be asked to do specific things for your computer, as in share your screen. And so right when I log in, I press share screen, but my settings on my MacBook weren't allowing it. So that's actually one thing that I feel like students weren't advised properly for. Make sure all your settings are aligned with what you need before the exam. So for example, for your MacBook, you can go on to your system preferences and you can make sure that Google Chrome is able to share your screen because it will tell you on the exam, oh, like you can't X out of this website, but it won't allow you to change the setting unless you do X out. So that was like a nightmare for me for sure, because I'm logged in and thinking, oh, I'm, I'm going to start my exam and, and everything's all set up, but it, it doesn't work that way. After that, then it'll prompt you to have a chat and be put into a waiting room. It will tell you if you X out of the waiting room, your wait time will be longer. So I assume some people that had issues with wait time might have X out of like the chat box because you're scheduled with a proctor at a specific time. So when you were having these tech issues, you had not yet interacted with your proctor. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, so it's kind of a barrier before you can even get help. But you know what? So one thing I did because I'm a major task rabbit is I logged into ProctorU about two weeks before and I downloaded the system that you're prompted to download once you start the exam. It's actually called Support and Rescue. It's a specific program for ProctorU that it will ask you to download for your exam. But I think that because I downloaded it, well before the time that I logged into my exam, I was able to get through the system much more quickly. So I'm getting the impression you're going to be one of the students who actually does the reading in law school. I think I will be. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So once you got into the waiting room, what happened from there? So then I got connected with a proctor and you know, immediately she could see me, she could hear me, and she started telling me what to do. She kind of told me the step-by-step of what to do. And I actually had a great experience with my proctor. She was very nice. She was very easy to handle, easy to deal with. It was a little strange because you can, she can see you, but you can't see her, you know, or him, whoever your proctor is. And you just have to bear with them. And whatever they say, you do. I wasn't really talking unless she spoke to me. I just took it step-by-step and made sure that Anything she asked me to do, I performed, and it made it a lot smoother. And so once you were actually taking the exam, did you have any interaction with your proctor? I know there's a chat box, so you don't necessarily have to hear their voice. So the chat box, she'll wi- the proctor will widen your screen that you don't see anything. The chat box is still there, but you won't be able to see it while you're taking your exam. So it's not a distraction whatsoever. The one thing that I actually did like about the proctor experience was she won't talk to you unless or they won't talk to you unless you say their name. So once you say your proctor's name, the screen pops up and it says calling and then my proctor's name was Abby. So it said calling Abby and then she was able to talk to me. So I'm not sure if she was fully watching me the whole time, but I do know that if I needed her, I was able to talk to her. I started my exam and of course, immediately it was my least favorite section and I was getting technical issues and and I immediately freaked out, you know, and called her name, but she was able to connect and and fix it immediately for me. So what what, uh, were technical issues? (laughs) We're both on the same page here. (laughs) Oh my God. Technical issues. Tell us more. (laughs) And technical issues. My te- Before you start your exam, she's going to make you read everything out loud and then you press start. Within probably five minutes, I had a pop-up saying, oh, your internet is too slow. And another thing that I have to tell everyone is make sure you're in a quiet room because if you're not, it will not allow you to take the exam. Oh, wow. Ooh. So you were you halted by noise in your room as well? Did you have to move? 
I didn't move, but I was at a window next to a highway. So any little noise was like disrupting my exam. But it it wasn't too bad because, you know, in my head, I think, okay, you never know what could happen. You have to be prepared. I I heard once that a car drove into a, a testing <laughs> testing room. So after I heard that, I was like, okay, be prepared for the worst. Expect the worst, but be happy if you get it smooth, you know? Well, at least you can expect when you're taking a test at home that hopefully no car will be driving through your room as you are taking the exam. <laughs> Although I suppose yeah. the students at that testing center also expected no car would be driving through their room. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> but no, this, that's absolutely, I mean, even when we were in a completely normal world of LSAT back when we had paper tests and testing centers and real live proctors. That was always my advice to students was assume that there is going to be dysfunction with the facility, dysfunction with your test booklet and dysfunction with your proctor. And you're also going to be in that room longer than you plan. I completely agree. I kept thinking, you know, my iPhone will turn off when it's still at 10%. Like, let me expect the worst for this because it's technology. You never know. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Exactly, exactly. So after you um, you got through your technical issues on your first reading comp section, how did the uh, test proceed from there? Actually, I feel like it went pretty smoothly. Uh, The one thing I was pretty unsure about was how it was going to go from each section. And luckily, they have a minute in between each section. So once I finished my first section, I got to take a little breather. I had the minute. There was a timer. And you were allowed to start it earlier if you wanted to. If not, you could take a minute to recoup and get ready for the next section, which was one of my biggest concerns because I was like, is the proctor going to talk to me? How am I moving to each section? So that's definitely, I think, a benefit. And so did you feel like as far as the subject matter of the exam went, was it what you were expecting? I mean, I know the makers of the LSAT are good at you know throwing a curveball here and there, but do you feel like it was more difficult than the exams that you've taken, less difficult, about the same? Honestly, I think it was the same. I was very worried in the beginning that it would be more difficult, but you know, logic games, I typically finish around 5 to 10 minutes early. I finished it around 7 minutes and 30 seconds early. Check out the big brain on bread. So, I kind of took that as, all right, this is really typical what I'm experiencing. The one thing is that a lot of people are taking three section exams. And it's good when you want to test yourself on the speed and the time. But I advise taking all four sections because it's going to give you the most percentages and give you the best ability to test your consistency. And you didn't on Logic Games, obviously, Brandon and I have both had you in our office hours. And we know that you are, you're very talented at Logic Games, you didn't have any issues being able to use your scratch paper, right? No, not, not at all. It, you know, my proctor had me show her every piece front and back, but it was, you know, regular paper. It was pretty comfortable because you're in a position where you're typically studying the exam. I, I put myself in a position where I was studying the exam and studying the LSAT in the same place every day to make sure that my mind was thinking, okay, this is where I am all LSAT, you know? So you're at an advantage in that case. Yeah, you're in your your special LSAT corner. Mm -hmm, Exactly. So once you got through the exam, there was supposed to be, and this didn't happen for some students, or at least we've heard reports that it didn't happen for some students, that there's kind of an outro process where they make you tear up your scratch paper. So what happened toward the end of the exam or once you were done? So at the end of the exam, you are told to call your proctor. And like I said, it like a pop-up comes up and says it's calling Abby, who was my proctor, and she comes back and she'll ask you to do everything, rip up the paper in front of her and, you know, put it to the side and that's it. Then you just X out of the chat box. But the only thing that was a little strange was I X out of my chat box and I was dying to go to the restroom. That was probably the worst experience for my exam. And so I ran to the restroom and I heard her voice and she was like, hey, like, are you there? I was like, 
oh my God, why are you still on there? I thought I I passed out. So that was, yes. So that was a little strange. I was like, why is she still on my computer? But, um, it, it really wasn't bad. I, I really think that if you stick with everything that they tell you to do, you're not going to have an issue. I think the technical issues are scaring people so much, but they're being blown out of proportion, I think. You you hear the worst stories. You don't hear the typical and the easy stories. So, Well, what? why was she still there? What, what hadn't been finished or was there nothing? I don't know. I think it's because she was sending me the survey because there's a survey afterwards that you can say how your proctor did and how how you liked her and what your experience was. And she sent it to me afterwards, but <laughs> that's all. Wow. So she's just, just have your proctor listening to you go to the restroom for no oh, apparent God. reason. <laughs> Everybody's I, worst nightmare. No, definitely. So you you touched on this a little bit already, but for students who are considering you know, deciding between taking the opportunity to take the June flex and holding off until we can have in-person LSATs again, do you have any advice for people in that position? Definitely. My number one advice is know your strengths. If you are strong in reading comprehension, take the LSAT flex. It's typically the longest section. Everybody knows that. That's where you're going to get the most points on the LSAT flex. If you're not consistent in each section either, don't take it. If you're not applying for 2020, I don't think there's any reason. You have to weigh the options. You know, so for me, I'm applying in fall. So I needed to take it. I want my score to come out. But if you're not being consistent with your scores, if you you just have to make sure that you're being consistent. And if you are, then take it because you know what you're going to get. You know what you're doing. But if you're having trouble with reading comprehension, I'd say I'd wait if you could. I, I'd be honest. So how do you think, if at all, LSAC should change the LSAT flex for the next administration? So they actually did send a survey out to all the LSAT flex takers. They asked a couple questions about what issues you had and if you liked your proctor and things like that. But I definitely think they need to provide more information to students. I thought, okay, I'm going to press enter my session and I'm going to get connected and all this. There are so many steps that you're able to do beforehand. When you go into the test, you're thinking, okay, I'm ready. I'm in LSAT mode. But you get kind of distracted having to talk to your proctor one-on-one and and going through all these different steps and all this reading, you know, all the different protocols and rules. And that can all be handled before. So I think they do a great job in allowing students to take it. But I think there are certain steps that are very unnecessary to keep until test day. That makes a lot of sense. I would I would agree with you. We definitely, you know, if we're having students at home in their comfortable zone anyway, then then why do anything that takes their focus away, especially if it's unexpected, which at least because there will no longer, never again will there be a first ever LSAT flex, at least it'll be less unexpected, but still can throw people off a little bit. Well, thank you again so much for being with us. Any Any last thoughts on the LSAT flex or anything that we haven't asked you that we should have asked you about that you want to share before we wish you uh, all of the best with your score release and send you off on your way to finish forgetting everything that you ever learned about the (laughs) LSAT and starting to learn about law school? No, honestly, I just want to make sure that anyone who is taking the LSAT flex in the future isn't scared of everything that they're reading online. You know, you always hear about the worst experiences, just like I said, but just be prepared for maybe something to happen. But don't be scared to take it. You're preparing, you know, the LSAT is not the day of the exam. It's all the preparation you've done before. So really, if you're consistent, you already got the score that you want to get. The LSAT is just confirming that. Well, that's great advice for all of our listeners. And Zaina Hatem, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Jelena. I had a pleasure being here. Thanks for tuning in today for our interview with Zaina. And keep an eye on your podcast feed for more LSAT Flex content coming your way. And if you'll be taking the June LSAT Flex, just a reminder that LSAT Max now offers flex mode on every released practice test with sections weighted equally, just like the real LSAT Flex. And that's our show for today. Thanks for listening. 
We really appreciate all of your ratings and reviews over the past couple of weeks, too. You can find all of our past episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. You can also send us a question at podcast at testmaxprep.com or record a short voice message at 310-893-6303. You can also check out the show notes for links to further reading and resources from today's episode. Until next week, stay hydrated, study hard, and remember, plenty Plenty of heroes heroes carry a briefcase. briefcase.